Well, today we're starting a new series. Um, it's timely. Um, during the holiday season, there's a lot of emotional, uh, I guess, darkness that people experience. There's all sorts of things that happen, and it seems like the holiday season accentuates the pain and the sufferings and the trials and tribulations uh, that we go through. Um, so we have to ask the question, is, is there hope in the midst of those storms? Certainly as that last song indicated, yes there is in Jesus Christ. He is our cornerstone. But a couple of things that I uh, wanted to mention um, right at the outset, uh, some statistics. Recently I went to the Billy Graham website and they had some statistics about the average neighborhood. And most of you live in a neighborhood and, you know, on average there's about a hundred people that live around you. Um, and out of that 100, here's what you can expect in their lives, that seven, seven of those neighbors are struggling with depression, uh, even contemplating suicide. Another seven of those neighbors are um, addicted to drugs or alcohol. They abuse drugs and alcohol in some way. Sixty, this is huge, sixty of those 100 don't profess to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Sixty out of 100, that is a huge number. Fourteen of those 100 feel crippled or trapped by fear and anxiety. And certainly that's huge right now. I mean, we're wondering about jobs and what our future is going to be, and we hear all of the news stories about the fiscal cliff and what is that going to mean to us? Are folks going to lose their jobs? Are we going to have food? Are we going to have to move out of our homes? And so that anxiety grips our hearts. And so 14 out of the 100 are grip, crippled or trapped by fear and anxiety. Three are grieving the death of a loved one. And eight are struggling with the loss of a job. That's almost a hundred out of a hundred that are suffering with something. Something's going on in life. Is there an answer? Is there a solution? Is there a way out of that darkness where we can experience hope in the midst of the storms and victory in this life? Well, Richard, come lead us. Let's pray. Lord God, um, we need to look at some hard stuff today. It's hard because it's so common. Uh, if it didn't affect all of us, we wouldn't think about it. But it does affect us. And we need you to show the truth as only you can show it as we go through these stories today. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Life, liberty, and the pursuit. One of our famous documents says of happiness. They almost got it right. We've talked about life here a lot. First life and then change. We've talked about liberty here a lot. First faith, then freedom. What we don't very often talk about is the pursuit of happiness. Because no one of you, not even me, is ever going to catch it. Happiness is always one step ahead. I wish they hadn't written it that way. I understand why they did. Because it has to do with the, our freedom to, to pursue things, to be better than we are, to educate ourselves, to work at whatever job we choose, rather than to be locked in because of how we were born or who we're related to or how much money we have. I understand that. But the happiness thing is a momentary thing. I can be happy right now and not happy the very next moment. And quite often we experience that all through the day. So I wanted to take a, a look at a couple of stories in the Old Testament. One of these stories 
the people involved did it exactly the wrong way. And one of the stories, the people involved, some of them tried to do it the wrong way, but others wouldn't let them. And I think you'll see God's hand in both of these. But first, I want to review a diagram with you. Um, we've changed this a little bit. Bob and I were talking, and, and <clears throat> what we realized is we had the wrong starting point. And the starting point is that life happens. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live, how much money you have or don't have, what kind of work you do. Life happens. Good things and bad things, right? Your finances can be great or terrible. You could have marriage issues. You could have trouble with your kids. Natural disasters. I mean, I read yesterday that, that in Long Island, a whole bunch of, of the power company customers got a normal bill, and they haven't had power for over a month. They were a little angry at that. Okay? Life happens. Good things can happen and bad things can happen. And don't think that when good things happen that you're somehow safe from misinterpreting them. Because a lot of us live, on the one hand, with fear that the other shoe is about to drop. Yeah, I know it's good right now. But, you know, I happen to be one of those people. <clears throat> In front of every silver lining is a cloud. My wife is constantly talking to me about this. Why are you saying these things? Well, it could happen. Mm -hmm. Other people have good things happen, and they expect that, oh, this is the way it's going to be from now on until the end of time. And when it isn't, now what? Okay, so life happens. All of us experience this. After life happens, certain emotions occur disappointment or fear, even elation, right? There's just a whole list of things I could put here. They're neither good nor bad, because when bad things happen, of course you should be disappointed. When good things happen, of course you should be elated, right? When certain things happen, kids don't get home at curfew, the fear, the worry begins to kick in. This is normal. Everybody does this, right? If somebody or you yourself have come to the conclusion that these emotions are bad, then you've come to the wrong conclusion. They just are. Right? It's what we do with them. And so we have a choice to make. We can react or we can respond. Notice that's an or. If you do one, a certain set of things happen. If you do the other, another set of things happen. Since it's so common, we'll start with the reaction part of the dis this decision tree. If you react, then defense mechanisms and or worldly thinking kick in. Okay. This is the, no, 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 it's not going to happen to me, not again, never again. Or, you know, I don't care what happens, I'm taking it. Okay. That that kind of thing. We'll see in our first example where the worldly thinking really hammered these people. If we continue on this leg of the journey, anger is sure to result. If you continue in anger, self-pity is sure to result. If you continue in self-pity, depression is sure to result. And if you continue in depression, you're going to end up in despair. Those seven people that Bob just talked about who were contemplating suicide have gone to despair. There's nothing anyone can say to them that will bring them out of their despair. It takes a work of God. It's one of the reasons why we, we stopped talking here about counseling. Because people used to come here and say, oh, now that I'm here, I'm a counselor. And they would go grab the most depressed person they can find off the street and say, you know, Jesus can fix that. And the people wander off. They say, why does that work? Well, first of all, you didn't have a relationship with them. Why should they pay any attention to you? Oh, you have to have a relationship? I thought you just had to give them truth. No, this is interpersonal stuff. And when someone's gone into despair, they are so drawn into, inside themselves that they don't want to respond to anybody or have a relationship. Okay? 
This first story is going to show you what happens when you run this leg of the journey. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Samuel chapter 13. 2 Samuel chapter 13, that's page 380 in my Bible. I have no idea where it is in yours. It's after 1 Samuel. Do I? Terrible. <laughs> Bad for me. I can tell I was a little busy with three days. Y'all, did you all see the email I sent out talking about Sunday the 28th? You see, all these, these dark things happen. No. So, 2 Samuel chapter 13. So this is the life happens portion of the story. Verse 1. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Okay? These things happen. We find it a little disconcerting in our day and age, but they weren't very closely related, just shared the same father. Remember, this was <laughs> a long time ago. And Amnon falls in love with Tamar. Life happened. Disappointment and fear followed. Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness on account of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. You know, I thought in, chap in the verse 1 he said that Amnon fell in love with her. And in verse 2 he's frustrated because he can't do anything to her. That doesn't sound like love to me. It's no wonder that he was frustrated. This word frustrated. Remember um, a couple of months ago when we were talking about faith, that, that Hebrew doesn't have um, conceptual words. They have very specific words, and the concepts are gleaned from the context and the way those words are used. So this particular word frustrated means bound up or tied up, quite literally tied up with ropes, distressed, troubled, oppressed, cramped, anxious, worried, in its verb form, it can mean to be an enemy or adversary. Who had tied up Amnon? Amnon. Who was Amnon's adversary or enemy? Amnon. All of this was happening in his head. He looked at this girl, fell in love with her because she was beautiful. She wasn't giving him the time of day. He was so frustrated he was fit to be tied. There's the disappointment and fear. It's starting to roil, starting to turn and churn, and he's in a bad way. So he reacted, and he had some help. It led to worldly thinking. Now Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, son of Shemaiah, David's brother. Okay, remember the story of David. When they came to look for the next king, Jesse sent all the sons from the oldest down. David was the youngest. So this means Shemaiah was one of the guys that was overlooked. He had a son named Jonadab, who was probably aware of the story. It says that Jonadab was a very shrewd man. Jonadab is looking for an angle. Amnon thinks he's a friend. He is, sort of, but as the story turns out with friends like this, who needs enemies? Okay. Jonadab asks Amnon, why do you, the king's son, look so haggard morning after morning? Won't you tell me? I mean, Amnon was losing sleep over this. Have any of you ever lost sleep over a girl? Come on, be honest. Yeah. Yeah. The rest of you are lying. <laughs> You're just afraid to say it. <laughs> Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Okay. Hey. 
go to bed and pretend to be ill, Jonadab said. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. This is Jonadab's advice. You know this isn't going well. So the worldly thinking leads to rape and hatred. The story goes on. David came and visited, sent Tamar in to cook for him. She cooked for him. And all his servants were there and all of that. And, and it still wasn't going the way he wanted it to go. So he sends all the servants out and says, Tamar, come feed me in my bed. Tamar, being innocent, walks in and sits down and starts feeding him. He grabs her arm. She figures it out and says no. But he refused to listen to her, and since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Is this just the greatest expression of love ever written in the Bible? You see, this is one of the reasons I like the Bible. It's a warts and all book. Right? If I was writing my history and have a legacy, I would probably write mostly good things. I would give a little hint of humanity so that the lesser mortals don't quite see me as unapproachable, but I don't want them to see all the warts. The Bible writers put it all in there. So Amnon, who claims to love his sister, half-sister, ends up raping her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Instantaneously. If you've read news reports or ever heard stories from or known people who have been raped, especially by people they knew, which is where most rapes occur, it started out as some guy saying, I really love you. And when the girl doesn't respond, then he gets forceful and overpowering. And when he's done, quite often, this is exactly what happens. Get up and get out. I mean, palpable hatred. He would have killed her on the spot if he thought it would do him any good. Well, what's the rest of the story? Tamar leaves, tears her robes, which was a sign that indeed she had been raped, and her brother Absalom finds her and brings her home to his house where she lives in seclusion as far as we know the rest of her life. And Absalom tells David, and David does nothing. Nothing. Absalom holds this in his heart. And now Absalom's got to deal with disappointment, and he does it the wrong way. And so because this, this, this series of things happened, it just started to cascade and two years later, after the harvest, Absalom throws a party and invites all of his brothers and half-brothers. And at the party, he, Absalom does, and he murders Amnon at the party. Kills him dead. All the rest of them run. They come running back to the palace. David's afraid that he's got a full-scale revolt on his hands. And Jonadab shows up. The same Jonadab. Well, David, I, I think it's going to be okay. It was only Amnon. And I think it was because he raped Tamar. No. I had nothing to do with it. You know, I'm just here serving you, my Lord. Does this sound familiar? I mean, I honestly did something. I, when I was prepping for this, I honestly watched 90210 this last week just to see how far it's gone. Thankfully, there was no nudity. But one of, the, one of the people was angry at her live-in boyfriend because he'd been injured and was in pain, and she thought he was whining. So she goes to some other guy and seduces him. Another guy who hasn't gotten what he thought he deserved from a company 
sells the company's secrets to another company and goes to work for them. And yet another guy who, you know, unrequited love kind of thing, exposed the, the relationship that one of the other characters was having with a teacher. Now that's all in the news now. For a half an hour, no, it went on for almost an hour. I, I kept turning away from it because it was just too disgusting. And I turned back and they were still doing it. They just went on and on and on and on. And the only thing that was happening was, you've done something I don't like, therefore I am justified to do anything to you or about you that I feel like doing and there's nothing you can do about it. And everybody goes, well, I guess you're right. This reflects our society, folks. This story of Amnon is what happens here. Day after day, you see it on the news, you read it in the magazines and newspapers. I mean, just stand in line at the grocery store and look at the covers only of all the magazines. And who's doing what to whom? What marriage has broken up? Who's cheating on whom? All of this stuff. This is what happens when you react to the disappointment. Notice the disappointment was okay. It was okay for Amnon to be disappointed. But it wasn't okay for him to react and go where he went. Nor was it good for Jonadab to do what he did, nor Absalom what he did. And Absalom's thing ended up in open rebellion, and even Absalom was killed, and David almost lost the kingdom. All because Amnon was disappointed and had no way of dealing with it in a healthy way. So what is God telling us in this? What does he say? Beware of this path. Every one of us is capable of it. Maybe we're not going to rape someone or commit murder or rebel against the government. But all of us go to the dark side if we don't pay attention. Every one of us can do this. I'll bet you every one of us has done this. I myself have been depressed many, many times because of certain situations. I didn't get what I wanted or something happened that should have happened and didn't and you know, now I feel justified and feeling sorry for myself. You know, I stand back and wait for the other shoe to drop on those people who were treating me so badly. You know, say things about people or write things about people. I mean, it, it got so that at Hewlett Packard, when I was working there, I, I finally had a manager come to me and say, Richard, why are you burning bridges? I said, am I burning bridges? He said, there, there's wreckage everywhere. Stop it. I said, why? They were wrong. He said, but you never know when you're going to have to work with these people again. And if you refuse to be in relationship with them and allow them to learn and for you to learn from them, you're never going to make it in this company. I'm thankful somebody said to me, stop it. You know, all these emotions running rampant, controlling me instead of looking at what's really happening. Okay? That's the terrible story. At the very least, it serves as a warning for each of us. Obviously, this isn't the way God would have had Amnon and Absalom and David work through this situation. When you, when you read a story like this, and it continues on, you can read the, the next several chapters, and then you see that David was called the man after God's own heart. Does it give you hope? David was capable of incredibly bad things. Most of us think about he and Bathsheba. But right at this moment may have been David's single worst moment because he refused to act as a father. He chose to act politically. And it nearly cost him. So this story is a beacon for all of us. Whenever you find yourself going down this path, think about Amnon. And say, God, help me. Don't let me go the route Amnon went. So, what's the alternative? The alternative is a response. So, if you're responding to the disappointment and the fear or the overrelation or, or whatever, instead of turning inward, 
we're counseled in the Bible to turn outward. So, uh, you all know Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? In view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as living sacrifices to God. Right? Don't be conformed anymore to the pattern of this world. Don't be forced into a mold. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can know what His will is. See, that's all outward focused. The Holy Spirit has taken up residence in me, and so this is unavailable to a lost person. Don't be surprised when lost people around you behave badly. That's all they can do. If they ever behave well, it's still probably self-interest that's getting them there. If you've come to Jesus, you have a chance of responding by the Spirit to the Spirit and having your mind renewed. And then, in Philippians 4, you, you know this verse, Whatever's going on, with thanksgiving, bring it to God and let him quiet your hearts and minds. See the difference? That's why we, in, in Hebrews and then last week, we've talked so much about thankfulness because thankfulness is outside of us. I mean, it just sounds silly when I say thank you, Richard, for being you. No, I, I never say that. You have to say thank you to someone Someone who has served you, who has helped you, who has taught you something. So when you say thank you, you're reflecting the grace of God back to him. You don't have that grace on your own, but since he has filled you with his grace, you can reflect it back to him. So you're getting outside of yourself instead of looking at your own situation. And then God does miraculous things in your mind. And that leads to thanksgiving, and that leads to peace and that leads to a renewed mind see how that works the only way to fix me on the inside is for me to look outside the left side of this picture I'm looking inside I'm feeling terrible well, why am I feeling terrible? Well, it's because I don't have what I want. Why don't I have what I want? Because they won't give it to me. Well, then I better go take it. And then I take it. And then you get phone calls. Oh, please pray for my son. Why? Well, he's on trial. What for? Sexual assault on a minor. Well, did he do it? Well, um, 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 and then, you know. Then you... you try to keep people focused in reality. Terrible things happen. It's because we get our minds and our eyes off of Jesus. So what's our second story? Uh, turn back to Ruth. We've talked about this a couple of times, but not quite this way. The whole book of Ruth is really not the story of Ruth, it's the story of Naomi and how she helped Ruth, but that's okay. So, before we do this, because if I don't cover this point, it won't make sense. When you're stuck over in the other dimension, the way out of it is not to go back through the spiral and up and over. You can't do it. It can only be done if you break out. Breaking out of that spiral is the greatest expression of your will that you will ever experience. And the farther down into that despair spiral you've gotten, the harder the breakout is. So if you're in your despair, you say, Oh Lord, if I could only be just depressed. And if I'm depressed, if I could just have self-pity for a while, and then I'll move back up. That doesn't work. It's a one-way trip. So break out. Break out in thankfulness. Break out as a new covenant believer. Okay? So now let's see how this happened with Naomi. So here's her life happens moments. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Chapter 1, verse 1. And a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. So we've got a famine, there's not enough food, that's bad. 
Let's go where there is food. Moab is that place. Well, how much trouble was it for a Jew to give up Israel and move to Moab? It's kind of a repudiation of everything. But this guy was concerned, and so they all went. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malan and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. This is tough. No fault of her own. She was serving her husband. She went with him. They moved there. They found reasonable living accommodations, and then he dies. Well, her sons are still there helping her, taking care of her as good Jewish sons should. And they met women and got married, and then they died. And so here we have three widows with nothing. The disappointment and fear shows up. Naomi decided to go back home to Bethlehem. And the daughters decided to go with her, the daughters-in-law. And she says to them, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Notice the fear in that statement, the disappointment in that statement. You can't come with me. Maybe, just maybe, because you've been so nice to me, God will give you husbands back home someplace. So go back home and perhaps you'll find a husband. There's no victory in this statement. Naomi is completely consumed with herself and her grief, and she projects it onto her daughters-in-law. So with that reaction comes the defense mechanisms. The two daughters-in-law say, no, 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 no. We're coming with you. And then she says, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? See how she's drawn in? Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. <laughs> She can't see anything except her own grief. She figures if they come with her, she's responsible for them. And she can't give them her own sons to become their husbands. So, you know, this just isn't going to go well, girls. Again, she can't see. Well, Orpah gives in and goes home. And will come back to Ruth. Notice how this total self-focus consumes Naomi to the point of bitterness. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? I haven't seen her for ten years. Naomi means pleasant or delight. Her response, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. That is the greatest statement of self-pity in the Bible. I went away full. God has done this to me. It's his fault. He treated me bitterly. So why shouldn't I be bitter? Have you ever heard that? God did that to me. Of course I'm bitter. God did no such thing to you. And yet all of us tend to say that. We may not be vocal about it, but when bad things happen, well, Lord, I mean, I've been reading my Bible and I've been praying. I've given money to people to people. I've given money to others as well. Lord, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to you? 
because we live in a fallen world. I mean, we, we fall for the lie of evolution, and here's how we fall for it. Somehow we've gotten the idea that after Adam, maybe a generation or two, certainly after Noah, all we had were cavemen. And of course, you know, they're dragging their women around by the hair and clubbing animals to eat and, and that sort of thing. We, 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 we have that idea in our heads because that's what we're taught. Well, nothing can be further from the truth. Those people were so far advanced compared to us that, that we wouldn't even recognize ourselves. Sin has caused the degradation of our world and our society, not its increase. So why do we blame God for the bad things that happen to us? I mean, Paul tells us in Romans, the earth groans. The earth is trying to tear itself apart because of sin. But that's where Naomi went. She went there big time. What's going to happen if she stays there? Well, she's going to go into depression, despair. But in this situation, other people began to break her out. She's over here on the left side of this thing. She is completely self-focused. She's full of self-pity. She's angry at God. Why, 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 and in particular, why me? So there were two phases of her breakout from this. The first one she was clueless at, but it still had an impact on her. Go back to when Ruth decides to stay. Orpah leaves. Right? Naomi has said, I, I can't provide sons for you. I'm too old to get married and have children, so you're, you know, you're going to be destitute without me. Ruth says, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you to leave you or to turn back. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. You would think after a statement like that that, that Naomi would start crying, and Ruth would start crying, and they'd hug each other. That's not what happened. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go on with her, she stopped urging her. So here was phase one of the breakout from this self-pity. Someone named Ruth came alongside Naomi, came alongside her, and she didn't get it. But that's okay, because Ruth came along beside her. Critically important. When you're suffering from this kind of self-pity and depression and control of, by your emotions, if you can find it in yourself to look out and see who is around you, what friends or family members? Just as a start. You know, most of us look around and go, well, they don't care. No, don't say that. Look around. Truly look around. There may be someone standing right there who is God's person for you. You may know them, you may be related to them, or they may be a stranger, but somebody is going to be put in your path that if you'll take a look, will help you break out of the self-pity and the depression. So it hadn't happened yet. Remember, after this is when Naomi said, well, I call me Naomi, I'm bitter, so call me bitter. So Ruth is there, and Naomi is relying on her and hasn't figured out yet that she's relying on her. But there's more that has to happen. So we need phase two. So, and this is, this is right after Naomi gives her speech about bitterness. If I was writing the story, I would have said, okay, so Mara returned from Moab. 
Notice that the writer says, so Naomi returned from Moab. All of those women who came charging out to say, wow, Naomi's back, heard her give this, this screed against God and how badly he had treated her. And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, you're just sad. You're home, you're home, come on. They didn't buy her lie. That's critically important. So her friends from before didn't buy the lie. They just called her Naomi. Come on in. Naomi's still shuffling along. Oh, I'm bitter. God's been mean to me. You know how it goes, right? If you don't shuffle physically, you sit in your chair at home and you shuffle mentally. Oh, poor me. I wouldn't be saying this if I hadn't done it myself, folks. So now you don't have to feel guilty. Yeah, he's just talking about himself. We don't have to pay any attention to that. No. So the friends just take her on in. We're still not done. We've still got more of phase two. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the, clan of Elimelech, from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. Aha, Boaz. And you know the rest of the story. Ruth goes to Boaz's field to glean. He spots her in the field, says, who's she married to? And people say, oh, no, she's not married. Uh, she is Naomi's daughter-in-law. He was married to one of Naomi's sons, and he died, and she's here taking care of Naomi. Boaz is impressed, very impressed. Wow, someone who's not even one of us, a Moabitess, would come to our country and take care of one of ours. That's impressive. So he goes to her, and he talks to her, and he says, from now on, don't glean in anybody else's field. Just glean here. And then he tells his harvesters, um, purposely miss things. So they're out, you know, harvesting, and harvesting, and then they, they'd miss and leave it and harvest and harvest. Because they, they'd harvest and they'd gather up, you know, handfuls of wheat and then they'd stack it together and tie it. And, and you always got a little bit because it would just fall by the side. But they were, you know, they were losing handfuls of this stuff. And, and Ruth would come along and gather it up and say, well, it's doing better than... <laughs> that I thought, and she'd go home. And, and so Boaz starts taking care of her. And they become interested in each other. You notice Naomi hasn't had to get married and have more children? That's what the self-pity does to you. Naomi is just being, and finally she, she looks outside of herself and says, oh, Boaz is interested in you. I get it. Oh, here's what you do. And then so she does things that are completely biblical in terms of, of courting in a relationship that makes it completely safe for both parties as opposed to what Amnon did. And Ruth and Boaz end up falling in love and they have a baby named Obed. Well, Obed was one of the great-grandfathers of David. And the book ends, the story ends with Naomi thrilled and dandling the little baby on her knee. Okay. Boaz plays the kinsman redeemer role. Sound familiar? Jesus is our kinsman redeemer? You know, we're not of Israel. We're some of those other people that don't even know God. But God brought us to a place where we could serve and be served. And Jesus dies and raises again. And we're made alive. Naomi was resurrected by her friends, by Boaz, and by Ruth. Because that's the way God worked it. Never underestimate the power of fellowship. Why did the writer in Hebrews make such a big deal in chapter 10? Remember chapter 10 is full of the terrible warnings, dire warnings. Accept Jesus or go to hell. Whoa. Right in the middle of all that. Don't give up. Don't forsake the meeting together with each other. 
Why? To build each other up in the faith, prepare each other for good works. It's what God does among us people who are his children. It's the power of fellowship. It's the power of people who look beyond our bad attitudes and say, yeah, we know that person's grieving over something. It's fine to grieve. But what can we do in the name of God to help them through this? What can we do to help them through this? You notice um, it doesn't record that, that Naomi had a bunch of theological discussions with people. They just came alongside and gave her a hug, talked to her about regular stuff, met her in the marketplace, hung out, just hung out and were friends. And slowly but surely, she could let go of the grief. It's not like it went away. It's not like it didn't happen. But she could put it in context and begin to respond to others and to break out of the cycle. So you see the whole picture again. I don't know that there's a one of us here who has ever, at the first sign of disappointment and fear, responded with thanks. Some of you may have gotten that far. I'm trying to remember in my own life if I've ever, ever responded in thanks. Usually I react. My first tendency is to react. Well, Lord. And what I see changing is that the point of breakout is changing. Sometimes I realize that I'm in this defense mechanism and worldly thinking mode. And I'm laying there staring at the ceiling at night getting angrier and angrier and the Spirit says, how's this going for you? Well, it's not going so well, Lord. Well, why don't you let go of it? Sometimes the Spirit doesn't catch me there. Sometimes I get down into the anger and self-pity. Then it's harder because I'm more withdrawn, more inwardly focused. But the Spirit never lets go, is never leaving us. And it's always inviting us. Just take a step out. And we think it's so difficult because it involves a choice. But once we've made that choice, it's like the Spirit sweeps that stuff away like it never existed, at least in terms of the bad emotions. Then you can deal with reality. You can have your mind renewed. You can fellowship. You can grow. You can find out what it means to have peace. And I wrote a bunch of songs back in the 70s. Um, I may have played one of them for some of you. Most of them you don't want to hear. I was begging God for peace. Begging Him for peace. I'm sure the music kept me sane because it was an outlet. Now Lois can tell you, she can tell how I feel by how I play. I needed to get out of legalism. I didn't know that. So God gave me music to help. And then he gave me friends to ask interesting questions. Very few people sat down with me and had long theological discussions. Those came in time, but first it had to get me out of myself and start looking outside into his word. And life changed. It's the same thing with all of you. Each of us tend to react first. And, and a measure of your walk with God, a measure of how your faith is going, is how quickly you catch on when you're in the emotional response side to the fact that you're responding emotionally, reacting emotionally instead of responding according to the Spirit. And it will vary. All of us are really good at certain things and really bad at others. So don't be surprised when the stuff you're not so good at drives you into a funk. And the Spirit works a little harder and a little longer and changes your life more dramatically in those instances. Right? And it all starts with saying thank you. 
the best way to break out of the downward spiral and into truth is to say thank you. Because we've already been given everything we need for life and godliness. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. We are saved. No one can take us out of Jesus' hands or his Father's hands because they're one. It's guaranteed, folks. So don't live there. This Christmas season, don't live there with the, with the denial and the guilt and the overspending. Most of us overspend because we're spending emotionally. It'll make me feel better. Well, it does for about five minutes. And then the realization of the bill coming due hits you. And now you're depressed again. But you're embarrassed to take it back. See the, the internal thinking? Instead, say, thank you, Lord. Maybe I can't get this gift this time. Even if it's for someone else, I just can't do it. So don't do it. Take your time. Save the money. Pay cash for it. Wow, now there's a gift. Right? Don't buy the lie that's being shown to you every day on TV and every day on radio. Say thank you and live the way God gives you to live. Let's pray. Well, Lord, we, we look at these stories. We see ourselves in them, in both of them. All of us have done this wrong from time to time, maybe too many times. All of us have done it right from time to time. Help us to realize sooner just what it is you've given to us, just what it means to follow you, to say thank you, and to rely on the Spirit to do the changing that is so desperately needed in all of our lives. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.